servant leadership has got two elements. It's got the service component, it's got the leadership component. Servant teaching has got the servant component, it's got the leadership component. So like, what do those entail? An aha moment was when I looked back at all my travels, I realized I'd lived with a family in Guatemala for nine months. I lived with um, a single mum in Manhattan for six months. I lived with a very poor Polish family in Gdansk, Poland, for one year. I lived with Kim's family in Malaysia for like 18 months. I had a hard moment, I, my goodness, they hosted me, they mm. accepted me. Though I was radically different to them, they made me feel as though I belonged. Okay? Oh, wow. So the first aha moment was like servant leaders host those in their proximity. Yeah. My work is in a classroom, lecture room with students, so I need to host them. That's where it starts. I host my students. So it's a very different dynamic by hosting them and all that entails. For me, servant nature, the servant part, we host and we listen. We listen to who? We listen to those who God puts in our world. Today's podcast episode is with Nick Todd. Nick Todd has been a good friend for over 20 years. I really rate this man. And so we're going to talk about some things and try and reproduce one of our mm. many weekly awesome conversations. Yeah. And we really want to um, leave an impartation with people. Okay, so Nick yeah. Todd, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Andrew. And uh, like we've had so many great conversations over those 20 years. Like Heavenly Father, may this be one of them. Yeah. May this be, you know, what one of the top 10. Okay. Yeah. So well, I love what you're doing and, and thank you for inviting me. Good. Well, we're on the bench. Like, we're on the bench here. So we are. we're sitting it's on gorgeous. the substitutes bench and we're watching the EPL game right now. Let's visualize that yeah, okay. um, between um, Tottenham Hotspur yeah. and. Your favourite team since boyhood was? Well, Leeds United. So um, that <laughs> game is only going to take place in like a uh, cup competition because we are in different leagues. <laughs> I remember the glory days of Leeds, yeah. mate. Can I just say, it shows, I think for both of us, great depth of character. Mm -mm -mm. That for over 45 years, we've both followed yeah, yeah, yeah. teams that literally have consistently broken our heart. Absolutely. So, like, uh, even on the drive in here, I was thinking of like that's a covenantal relationship, okay, <laughs> through thick and thin, through mountain and valley, and there's been the occasional mountain, but <laughs> there's been a whole load of valleys, okay. Now yeah. you, you're not quite in the valley at the moment. You're doing all right. We're, we're in top four. Oh, we won this yeah. morning. Okay. Well done. <laughs> Pleased for you. And um, you know, we're in the division below, just trying to kind of fight our way out to get back to where we deserve to be. Yeah, I okay. agree. We're believing for great things Thank for Leeds United. Hey, we um, were a church planning team together. We were indeed. That's how we met. We're both in higher ed. Yeah. Um, we both like a good reflective chat. Mm. If you went through our SMS trail, oh, yeah. it, it would be a combination of um, you're one of my best encouragers, so thank mm. you for that. Uh, you, you'll send a quote, a tasty morsel mm -hmm. of a quote, which we will then either develop into some a great lesson mm -hmm. or some sort of social media post, or yeah. I will borrow it, leverage it, and I will mm -hmm. I will post it, and um, I should give you more credit for that. We've both got beautiful well, wives. The thoughts are not necessarily <laughs> mine, but from my kind of uh, research or excavating, and I just share it. So they're not necessarily my top ideas. Oh, oh okay. so you're throwing me a dummy one every now and then. <laughs> uh, from, from, a, from an expert elsewhere. Okay. Yeah, and then we, food, like our last dinner together was yeah, um, yeah. Kim educating us on yeah. the wonders of, of Chinese food, one of your, fav your favourite restaurants. Well, she chose that. <laughs> like, so my wife is Malaysian, Chinese Malaysian, so um, she, she decided where yourself, myself and Sean were going to go. I was a little bit worried. Because it was it was kind of strongly, um, you know, Sichuan and Chinese, and um, but it was a wonderful night. Oh, she ordered like a boss. Yeah, all right. She okay. took command. She uh, did. Co command of the ordering. Yeah, yeah. We've both got mm. raising kids. Sorry. Well, yeah, like she ordered fungus. Okay. Yeah. Remember? And I, I, I tapped on the knee. Yeah, I tapped her on the knee to say awesome. no, no. But she did it nevertheless, <laughs> and it was an inspired choice. Yeah. Okay. Raising kids. Mm. We're a Christian. We've got a passion for. Christian 
uh, education, faith-based education, yeah, Peter 12 for our children. We're mm-hmm. both involved in higher ed. We're both mm-hmm. involved in mega churches. We're yeah. about the same age, birthdays, mm-hmm. literally less than a month apart. Yeah. Anyway, a brother from another mother. Mm. One of the We better get in the podcast yeah, soon, on. but one of my favourite things was watching you and Kim interact um, and saying when you lived in London Mm-mm-mm. and um, on a Saturday night, yep. you would... Um, go for a walk, I think, Mm-mm. through the West End Mm-mm. and you would go and get the Sunday papers early, Yeah, go to the bagel shop, Mm-mm. get some bagels, walk home. Yeah. And then Kim said like this, like it was like a 20-minute walk or something like that. Mm. And she goes, one of my favourite things about that mm. is holding Nick's hand because mm. going anywhere holding Nick's hand makes me happy. <laughs> well, you know, like, yes. um, I think research shows you, you married couples hold hands, pray together. Like um, they don't get into the trouble that um, a lot of marriages have to kind of navigate of growing yeah. old and, and distant and so forth. So, um, you know, those walks were beautiful. Now, it was the uh, <laughs> West End is central London, Chinatown. Yeah. But she was talking East London, East End. So that's, West, that's West Ham territory. That is West Ham territory. Um, that is, um, you know, like Cockney London territory. And so, um, yeah, you know, the Brick Lane for the Indian. So we get an Indian uh, uh, meal. And then just next to it, there's a bagel shop open 24 hours. It was busier at 3 o'clock in the morning than it was in 3 o'clock in the afternoon. But 24-7, get the bagels. In those days, um, it was printed newspapers, so you'd get you'd do your Indian, you'd get your um, bagels, and you'd get your Sunday newspapers Saturday night at 10 o'clock. And then we'd just walk home, and it'd be 20 minutes to our apartment. And on the way, we'd walk by um, um, William Booth's statue, um, Salvation Army. And so in my studies, I then kind of did a bit of research about mm-hmm. them, like, So we're, we're with mega churches. We, we want kingdom, but to walk by his statue to come to Australia and then to find that we're living in an area of southeast Queensland, which is the first area of Salvation Army when they kind of came over here. That's kind of kingdom impact. That's kingdom yeah. uh, territory taking. That's what I want to be a part of. That's what I want you to be a part of. And so yeah. that's, that's, that's what this conversation is partly about. Okay? Yeah. So the walks were great. Okay, Great memories. But also there's an element there of like, um, let's be like William Booth. Like Salvation Army as a title is like genius, is it? Yeah. Not? Okay. So the walk was great on many levels. Yeah. Okay. So, man from London. Yes. Um, London is my town. London town. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As Mark Knopfler sings down in London town. Anyway, um, country. You could be one of the most interesting person I've met. So, can we start with what countries mm. have you visited and and, and worked in? Because I know there's Guatemala yeah. in there and Dubai, yeah. so... Yeah, so uh, before I rattle them off, like, um, um, we're all interesting, but we need to listen to each other's stories to find out why the other person is inherently interesting. So it's nice that you say that I'm interesting. But to answer the question, um, first 18 years, um, UK, um, and then moved to London and worked in London. Um, and though from 18 to 36, the next 18 years really were very nomadic and Mm. meandering. And so if I think through those countries or cities that I worked in from leaving home age 18, we have London. A couple of years after that, we have Guatemala City. Maybe a year after that, um, a a year in Guatemala City. A year after that, we had six months in uh, Manhattan, New York. Um, Shortly after that, returned to London, we had Gdansk, Poland. That was teaching for a year. Um, we then had, I'm a married man by that time, um, and so Kim and myself did three years in Dubai, United Amer- Amer- Emirates, and we had uh, maybe two years, Kim's Malaysian, I've already let yeah. that out of the bag, so we did two years in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. So there's a fair number of countries in there, and my, you know, working in them was, was my journey from being 18 to the, like, 36, that 18-year chunk. And then you landed in the Western Corridor. Yeah, so then, yeah. since then, we came in 2003 yeah. to Australia and we kind of have settled and anchored down, kind of felt called um, by God. And, um, and so the, the wandering has stopped, but there's inherent lessons that I learned from those travels yeah. that have really have shaped me. And then also, you know, like God making my lifetime partner, somebody from a very different culture, yeah. from a de- very different um, nation, 
different background, different traditions, still loving Jesus, like blending that yeah. together has been yeah. nothing short of a inherent blessing for me. And hopefully yeah. for Kim as well, if she was here. Okay. This is where some of your rich storytelling comes out in your classroom when you're lecturing, coaching yeah, okay. and shaping our, our, our students. I know this, you've got one of the best collections of rock concert oh, yeah, ticket okay. stubs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember okay. you showed me once because you've mm. seen, like, well, wh- who did you see in New York? Was that Queen? Um, in uh, well, look, cent- so Central Park? I'm going to, well, Paul Simon in Central Park, yeah. which was a free gig, okay? So that's when I um, did the six months in New York. The first weekend, there's a, there's a concert in Central Park. It's Paul Simon. It's free, not with Garfunkel. It's just solo. Um, that was amazing, <laughs> okay? And then um, while I worked in London, I worked in the music industry um, with Tim Rice, who wrote Jesus mm. Christ Superstar, Avita, Joseph in his Technicolor Dreamcoat or what have you. And through Tim Rice, I got um, free tickets to the last two last two concerts that Queen performed in England. So you got Queen at Wembley. Like yeah. I was there. That that's a, that's an album. Queen live at Wembley. I'm on You're the there. album. Okay. Yeah. I'm actually on the Paul Simon one I think as well. Okay. <laughs> um, and then their last gig was at Nebworth shortly afterwards. So um I attended the last two gigs with Freddie Mercury of Queen. Okay. Wow. And uh, well and then you know like his ability to grasp yeah. You know, 80,000 at Wembley, 120,000 yeah. at Nedworth was just um, beautiful and artistic. And he held the audience by, the th- by his hand, just took them to, you know, his catalogue of hits. It was, it yeah. was majestic. So we've done, at, um, we've done U2 and we've, yeah, done, we've done John Cougar Mellencamp and, at and Suncorp. And John Bon Jovi. That, 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 was, okay. a bit well, disappo- bon Jovi. that was a bit disappointing, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. We had to wait all the end to living on a prayer. Like, yeah. Okay. Uh, that, yeah. was a, that was a long night, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, and uh, it, like Mellencamp was good, but I love it when the band and the lead singer, you can see that they're giving everything for it. Yeah. So like um, John Bon Jovi, like, uh, he didn't talk to me, you understand? Yeah. Yeah. And the, um, the sound system wasn't great, okay? Yeah. You too, like the 360. Oh, wasn't that a banger? Um, Suncorp, phenomenal. And I got cheap tickets as well for so, somehow. So did I. Okay. And Bono, wasn't he the master? Yeah, he was. Okay. Had Jay Crafted. Okay. Jay-Z was before there whipping up the crowd. Mm-mm. I remember my daughter's going, Dad, look at Jay-Z. And I said, Mm-mm. oh, that's a paper bag performer. Yeah, Wait till yeah. Bono gets on because Jay-Z's whipping up the crowd. Yo, yo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, get him around there and he only gets him going 20 seconds. Yeah. And then Bono comes mm-hmm. out. I think it starts off with mm-hmm. City of Blinding Lights or mm-hmm. something like that. Yeah. And then Bono crouches down, lifts up his arm, mm-hmm. and the whole yeah. crowd just surges and yeah, rises absolutely. to his feet. Like yeah. he was just waved his arm. I turned to Katie and said, that's how it's done, love. Well, you know, like um, <laughs> they've got a good um, back catalogue. They know yeah. they're good. They've done plenty of gigs. They prepare well. So he's in his element, in his lane. Yeah. And um, just to see that. like, And I kind of think... Um, church should be equally like penetrating, moving, emotional, all consuming. And so, um, like, uh, it's good to see Bono do his stuff. It's good to see Freddie do his stuff. But come on, local church, let's let's do our stuff well. Okay. Well, let's let's get talk about that. Like, you've been just a, a new appointment. We'll talk about that in a sec. But mm. you've been shaped over a long period of time. Can you just sort of just dance us through just the headlines of your resume? Mm-mm-mm. Like, you've left high school. Yeah, and then w- what sort of jobs have you had through, and then yeah. what are you doing now? So um, I would say, like, I fell into my calling. So I'm a teacher at heart. Okay. Um, however, I would say through the Great Commission, we are all meant to be teachers. Go okay. therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing, teaching them to obey. So like, yep. um, I feel called to what we should all be called to. Okay. Um, so in Guatemala, when I was there traveling through, learning Spanish to go to university, that's where I kind of, um, I halted my travels, lived in Guatemala, did some teaching, got well paid, got paid more teaching English to Guatemalans than my Guatemalan friends got paid teaching me Spanish. So there was mm. an introduction to injustice right there. But I kind of, um, I, I learned a love of teaching in Guatemala, went back to London, got some qualifications, did a cert, did a diploma to teach English as a foreign language, okay? That gave me license to travel. So Mm. the travels that kind of fell out of that, that I've kind of talked about, 
were all like, ha- I'm not a tent maker like Paul, but I was an English language teacher. So that kind yeah. of opened up that kind of career. Um, and um, really, to progress that, you need to get some more qualifications. So I like, elevated up my qualifications, which opened up teaching not in a language school, but in a university. So after I'd been teaching for maybe 10 years, I moved from language school to um, higher education. Mm. And then, let me just think, I think I've, I've worked in four um, universities. Two of them have been Islamic, okay? One was in Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur. One was in Dubai. And so I kind of morphed from an English language teacher to um, working in higher education as a lecturer. They call it lecturer. That's just, mm. you know, their posh word for uh, teacher. And um, me and Kim came to Australia um, and migrated. She got the points, for us to migrate mm. out here because she's a nurse. And then again, I fell into teaching in higher education. So um, I have spent 18 years, first at Griffith University, the majority now like 17 and a half years maybe at um, the University of Southern Queensland, left yep. that last year. So like, there's a journey of finishing school, working in London, travelling and being apprenticed as a teacher, getting some more qualifications to move from kind of language school to higher education. I think the language school and the travels um, enabled me to see the inherent beauty in each individual who is different to you. So even in um, Malaysia at the Islamic, International Islamic University there, as a Christian, I'd have a class of 30 students with 25 different nationalities. So I just loved, I like, um, I'm their teacher, but they're teaching me about their cultures. They're teaching me about their stories. So I love that. And that really, I think, apprenticed me in learning how beautiful and how much dignity um, each person has. And I'm interested mm. in who they are, where they've come from, what's their story. And I brought that into my teaching, and I talk that, brought that into my career, and I, I brought that into my faith journey as well. Okay? Um, and so I really like uh, travels, teaching, higher education. And here we are, you know, 2024. You finally got headhunted by your church too? Uh, so yes. What's, what's happened recently? So I, um, last year I uh, was the year when I departed my employer who I'd been with for 17 odd years. And that kind of, uh, that season closed off quite naturally, I would say, supernaturally Mm. um, because it was the year in which I finished off a PhD that (laughs) had taken a chunk of time close to a decade so that closed off last year and as that was closing off the opportunity arose um, to put my hat in the ring for a new job at the church I uh, frequent and have been at for since 2005 2006 really to come on board as should I should I let them know the yeah. title like um, it's not discipleship pastor because there's a credentialing process yeah. um, which is underway but it is discipleship oversight so like wow. I have spilled in the last year out of higher education into full time ministry paid with this new job which is discipleship oversight I see that as a continuation of my faith journey yeah. I see that yeah. as a continuation of my education journey I see that kind of like um, the planets aligning beautifully like orchestrated and superintended by my Heavenly Father. And um, I'd say everything we've talked about now has apprenticed me for this moment, for this season, this new season. I'm fractionally older than you, as I said at the beginning, Um, but um, at an age when many guys might settle, slow down, you would call it in England, like gather dust, like... I have been given this rich opportunity to take everything that I've experienced or learned over several decades and funnel that, that wisdom, if there is wisdom, that knowledge, that insight, into Mm. being um, the guy who is oversighting discipleship at my local church, which I love. That's great. It's a wonderful convergence season, Mm -hmm. mid-50s. Now, the Proverbs that like says the way, mid, the way, the, beyond mid. Uh, the, the way of the wise winds upward. Like there's, yeah, yeah, there's yeah. this okay. upward call. Like yeah, we're just yeah. getting better and better. So you can talk to me about my English later on. <laughs> it's now it's, like, there's it's a little sense as well of being yeah. like um, yeah, upward and upward, but um, but almost a sense of hey, I think I've been apprenticed. I'm pretty praise God, thank you. But I'm out my comfort zone 
spiraling upwards rather than spiraling into um, settling and, and just, you know, leth- lethargy and, and, you know, a sedentary yeah. lifestyle or a sedentary faith lifestyle. No. So I'm out of my comfort zone and, and because I see his fingerprints on it, I'm happy to be outside the comfort zone clinging to him to help me and him do this job to the best of my ability by his mm. grace. Mm. Okay. Well, what a blessing for the Western Corridor. Start off several versions of Westlife Church, now Hillsong Greater Springfield, mm. serving there with um, Pastors Andrew and Crystal Midson yes. in the mighty Hillsong Network. Oh, yeah. it's, it's been the most wonderful, inspiring well. story. While lecturing for us, you've had six years of Mm-mm. contract lecturing and Correct. the students been a huge love you. Like, oh, it's just great us being able to interact one day a week yeah, where yeah. you light up the classroom doing year one and then year two, two I'd years. Say, like just to, um, and it's not a humility card, like I'm not special, but um, I want my students individually to know um, I'm interested in their well-being. I'm, yeah. I'm championing them on, on their journey, whether they're a high distinction student, a C student or a borderline pass student. It, my, my desire for them to... Uh, cross the line and, and, and go forward to all that God has for them is the same for all of them. And so I'm, I'm just kind of um, applauding them on, teaching them, listening to them, listening to their stories and saying, like, you, know, like you and God, you can do this, okay? That got doesn't make me a great teacher, okay? Okay, well, we, we think it does because <laughs> the students love it. I remember when M- M- Melbourne, one of our online students, rang me up one day. I just got some feedback. Like, she's a high distinction student, right? Mm-mm-mm. Highly, very diligent. She goes... Andrew, I've just got feedback from Nick. He mm. he thinks I can get some of the top marks yeah. in the in the, in the unit. <laughs> and I'm just thinking you've drunk the Nick Todd well, you know, education transformational servant teaching Kool Aid. Well, feedback is crucial. So I know <laughs> I've listened to your podcast. There's one we'll, we won't name that person who talked about that they they like you know feedback that critiques. Yeah, yeah. Because um, it helps them understand the gap that they need to bridge. Okay. I'm all for that, but I don't like the word critique, okay? Yeah, okay. Um, now, servant leadership and servant leaders embrace feedback that is of a critiquing nature because it's not about ego or, or, or pride or me doing the job. Mm. It is about the mission. So servant leaders can take on board um, the critique that seeks to make, you know, better, more fruitful, more flourishing, the mission at hand. And, and therefore, I think... Um, students are on that journey towards a flourishing life, God's flourishing life for them. Yeah. So we can give we can give feedback that critiques wrapped in a whole ton of encouragement. Yeah. Okay. And I think that's the for me that's the Jesus way. Well, this segues beautifully in to this next question. Like you've done a doctorate, why a doctorate, Mm-mm. and what's the title? What's about? Because you've leaked out some of the words already. Yeah. 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 So. Um, why a doctorate? There's kind of a couple of answers yeah. to that. One would be if you are in higher education, um, it's a given that that's part of the journey that you're yeah. on. Okay, yeah. um, and so there was there was that. Okay, so there's pressure from the you know academy yeah. on Nick Todd to sign up and all my colleagues as well to sign up. Um, and I was, once I knew what I wanted to kind of um, study in depth. I'm okay with that pressure because ultimately um, my focus, I felt, was God-selected rather yeah. than yeah. academy-selected. And so um, the doctorate commenced in 2016 and um, it was on um, servant leadership. It wasn't at that stage on servant teaching, but, but come back you know, two, three years later out of investigating servant leadership had bubbled up this thing called servant teaching. Um, and, and so like, if I think of the title, give me a second. Um, I wanted initially to interview my own students simply to see to what extent they said I was a servant teacher. That's what mm. I wanted my PhD to be. Um, but the academy, as in my head of school, would not give me permission to survey my own students. 
Because well, there's ethical considerations, was there? Yeah, like yeah. now, I I kind of retrospectively would view that as being negative forces, not wanting servant leadership to be investigated doctorally in a secular university. Mm. Okay, because higher education adopts a different approach mm. to leadership. So it's like, um, if I can't interview my students to say, to find from them, am I a servant teacher? Like, what on earth can I do? So my, me and my supervisor, Patrick, who was a gift from God, um, shifted the focus from my students onto me, okay? That's where the auto-ethnographic That's method where the came out, yeah. See how quickly component. I said that? Auto-ethnographic, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. And then, um, so it became, I think, the, the posh formal title, um, one Australian academic's journey <laughs> embedding servant leadership in two online enabling courses. So essentially wow. it's me looking at a couple of courses that I wrote in 2011, uh, you, know, you know, crafted in 2010 but started to deliver in 2011, how they had been woven with servant leadership and then ultimately servant teaching and what was my journey to embracing servant leadership so that I could embed it, okay? Mm. And so um, it was a glorious journey. There's two elements there, okay? One is an educational journey, uh, which is servant teaching, teaching in a student-focused manner, and the other is faith, okay? Yeah. So I, I'm merging my faith, how I see Jesus... Um, work with his students in the Gospels, how he does what he does as a rabbi, as a teacher, trying to kind of sneakily weave that into how I do my teaching okay, wow. with my students in my secular university and just investigating that. Therein is the doctorate. Now, on the side, I'm doing teaching with School of Ministries at CHC, um, which is a Christian university. So, like, um, um, I can bring faith clearly into yeah. that context. I yeah. can't bring it into my secular um, Australian university, but I can still teach in a Jesus-like manner. Yeah. So the doctorate was investigating that and looking at my journey to see, like, how I fell in love with servant teaching and servant leadership, and then cascading out of that, there's, you know, like it's good to give birth to a model. So I've got a model yeah. of servant leadership, model of servant teaching, and then I've got a model of, um, I'm going to throw out a, a posh mm -hmm. academic word that um, that um, is not necessarily easily kind of um, defined, but neoliberalism. So like yeah. when I'm teaching in my secular university, um, I felt as though I'm a modern-day Joseph in Egypt or I'm a modern-day Daniel in Babylon. And I get that Joseph was elevated up. I get that Daniel was elevated up. But it seemed to me that in secular higher education, um, I wouldn't be able to be elevated up because they have got a very radical different view of leadership. So I have to be subversive. And in my classroom, because I can close the door and I'm then the king of the classroom, I can <laughs> teach the secular stuff as Jesus would have teach, wow. taught it, if he had been there. He ain't there, but I'm there on his behalf. Wow. Does so, that make sense? Oh, that, that's wonderful. So I don't want to be crass, but you ten, crass. Ten, 10 years sucked into, what were, what were a couple of your, your key findings? Because this is absolutely inspiring. Yeah. Like you, one of them would be uh, you come up with a model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But okay. do you want to just talk it through what some of the aha moments are for someone who just wants to go the abstract or just put your conclusion into the AI and say, give me a yeah, 250 yeah. word summary of 10 oh. years worth of dedicated right. research. Um, like, uh, happy to do so. Okay. Yeah. And I just hope that I can exp like, in the PhD, from, from my perspective, it's crystal clear and it's been ticked and approved yeah. by those who read it, who, who've signed off on it. So um, some of these things I better articulate in the written word than the spoken word, but I'll give it my best and Heavenly Father help me. Um, we'll get the, we'll get listeners to put something <laughs> in the comments. Go, yeah. we'll, we'll give you a, a rating. See, 
good effort, Nick. You yeah. know, well, all you're, right. doing, you're coming along nicely. Servant leadership has got two elements. It's got the service component, it's got the leadership component. Servant teaching has got the servant component, it's got the leadership component. So like, what do those entail? Um, so um, an aha moment was when I looked back at all my travels, I realised... I'd lived with a family in Guatemala for nine months. I lived with um, a single mum in Manhattan for six months. I lived with a very poor Polish family in Gdansk, Poland, for one year. I lived with, you know, Kim's family in Malaysia for like 18 months, just a poor rural Chinese family, okay? And um, I had a hard moment, like, my goodness, they hosted me. They mm. accepted me. I could get a bit wobbly here. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> they, though I was radically different to them, they made me feel as though I belonged. Okay. Oh wow! So the first aha moment was, um, like servant leaders host those in their proximity. Yeah. M- my work is in a classroom, lecture room with students, so I need to host them. That's where it starts. I host my students, so it's a very different dynamic. But um, by hosting them, this is still the service component, the servant component, by hosting them and all that entails, um, I need to almost um, uh, allow the relationship to surface and grow, develop slowly, quietly, like kingdom-like growth, which looks small, by listening to them. Okay, mm. so like um, for me, servant leadership, the servant part, we host and we listen. We listen to who? We listen to those who God puts in our world. For me, it's 25 students in a classroom, 50 students in a classroom, or online with 100 students. I've got to listen to them. I've got to get to know them. So I've got to you know, go above and beyond that each individual student in a group of 20, 50, 100 thinks they are known by me. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. there's a whole load of work there. You could call it <laughs> inconvenience there. Emails, texts, phone calls, like um, forum posts, just to enable them to know, ah, oh, like this guy is different to the run of the mill university teacher because they know who I am. They've heard as much as I'm willing to share. I f- that they feel I'm hosting them and I've heard them. That's the that's the service because most of our students would have your mobile number as well. Well, you know, yeah. I, uh, you know, I, when <laughs> and I you you would go and meet them in coffee yeah, yeah. shops and, and review drafts. Correct. So that's I, what I, I found out later on. I call that like the the Bob Goff principle. Bob yeah. Goff read his stuff; yeah. he's fantastic. And in, in his books, he puts his phone number. And I and, and the <laughs> publishers, whoever it was, said, "Bob, what are you doing?" And it, but he put his mobile phone number in there. So I give my mobile phone number out liberally to all my students and then if there's anything they want to um, ask me about they can that's all part of hosting and listening hosting and listening so um and we might think there's the tsunami and it's just unsustainable i have found that it's not okay Uh, i found that they do get in touch but they don't all get in touch but all (laughs) know that i've made that step okay so hosting and listening uh, that enables me to to kind of then move into the leadership component which mm. is um, a whole bunch of reflecting and um, and and so I host I listen I reflect and then um, I'm looking to build like that individual student on the journey they're on to the destination that they would need to go to to meet all the course outcomes but also like um, I understand I've got those students at my secular university I've got our school of ministry students mm. for a season so, like, both those students from my secular world, from my ministry, school of ministries mm. world, they're actually, they're both going on that journey. They don't both know, because some are ag- atheists and agnostics, they both don't know the element that God's sovereign to that journey and wants to be on the journey with them. Mm. But I'm taking them educationally on that journey towards yeah. what? Like, wow. it's a flourishing life. Mm. Um, so, you know. It, when I do my job of teaching, I'm looking to host, I'm looking to listen, I'm looking to reflect, and I'm looking to build. I would <laughs> put that model over the Great Commission because 
might like, build is 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 kind of making disciples. Yeah. So I want I want all my students to be aware of um, their inherent value, their inherent worth, and that whether they've picked up some educational scars mm. from secondary school, from elsewhere, from not feeling worthy or capable, I'm come with I'm coming with a different story that wow. you are capable. That there is potential in you for a season. You're with me. Let's journey together. Host, listen, reflect, and let's build. And in fact, like they build me as much as I build them. Okay. I, I hope a, a book on pedagogy is coming out. Yeah, so say, pedagogy means like to teach. I'd say so as, as well, like so that you know, um, host, listen, reflect, build. Servant leadership, servant teaching. They are not a project. Okay, like yeah. they are not a project. And, and so the build component, like I view myself as being an architect. I see Paul's doing that in the Gospels with, with the Timothys, okay, just architecturally mm. building him up for the life of ministry. Yeah. So um, it sounds a little bit clunky, build, okay, at the end, because uh, I'm working with human beings, but it's um, to equip and empower them to go on beyond me to the flourishing life. See, I'm loving how you're linking in with the flourishing okay. life. You've always well, been good at that. That's John 10.10. 10, yeah, I mean. yeah, okay. yeah, it's one of the grand narratives across 66 books of the Bible Yeah, because you do teach our biblical interpretation <laughs> unit. Yeah, thanks, Coach. Um, I've seen I've seen you um, do a lot of work in low socioeconomic areas yes. and people from marginalised backgrounds, even prisoners. Yep, yep, yep. Is there one or two stories that come to mind uh, of students who you've just have thought of being a good exemplar of this this sort of four-part model you developed, like where yeah. they've come from and then where they ended up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to just park it. His yeah. name's Paul. Yeah. So if I forget, bring me back yeah. to the story about Paul. Um, but, yes, um, I have found it more rewarding and satisfying. So the 17-plus years that I've done most recently at the University of Southern Queensland... University of Southern Queensland is a regional university, so we have a lot of students from low socioeconomic mm. backgrounds. We have um, a high percentage of our students are the first in their family to come into university. So, like, um, I had a beautiful... I was, I was privileged to be able to welcome them, come on in, through yeah. the doors into higher education, and I was aware that they had got scars and bruises, educational bruises yeah. and scars they might have been correctional students in, in prison in which case they didn't come into my classroom it was like online um but they were just waiting for someone i could cry sorry yeah it's a they were waiting for someone to say uh who are you to even think you could journey wow. towards the flourishing life okay wow. and um <laughs> I just felt blessed to be able to uh, say to them, there's a different story. Yeah. Let's, let's write a different story. Together. Together. Yeah. And I'm not going to be with, I'm not going to stalk <laughs> you or haunt you forever and ever, yeah. but let's get you yeah. up and running and off you go. So <laughs> I'm, I'm down, I'm good now. That's good. But um, it is true that a lot of my students self doubted themselves. Yeah. And so, you know, self-doubt, anxious, you know, please tell me I'm in the wrong place and I'll just go home and I'll put to one side all those dreams that have caused mm. me foolishly to yeah. put an uh, application into universities. I, I just want to dismantle all that, okay? Yeah. So I'll give you a... Um, this is uh, going back to my starting first years at University of uh, Southern Queensland. A student called Paul, is it, so Paul P, I won't do his surname, yeah. but he was of Vietnamese background. And uh, so he had signed up to do a Bachelor of Education, wanted to be a teacher. He was um, Laotian of descent, um, and, and no one from his family would ever have come to university. So he came in, um, and um, I was part of the learning support unit. So a couple of the education teachers who were teaching Paul came to see me and said, we got this guy Paul in our class. We reckon he shouldn't be here. You need to counsel him to exit and, mm. um, you know, downplay his dreams and aspirations. And so um, uh, I kind of thought that through. I went to, like, my boss and said, 
before I engage with Paul, um, are you okay if I counsel him to, you know, go elsewhere? And it's a bit like the speech that you, you gave us before we were recording this podcast. Like, we will do everything. Once Paul has signed up and paid his money and come on board, we will do everything to maximise the opportunities for mm. him to be successful. So I like, took that on board, got in touch with Paul, had a, a meeting, and just uh, talked to him about, like, I know it's hard, I know it's difficult, I know you feel squished, I know you feel as though you cannot. So you've got two options. Like, we could kind of just put the white towel in the ring and off mm. we go somewhere else and those aspirations to be a teacher, um, uh, you know, I just put on the back burner and never surface. Yeah. The other alternative is if you work hard, I'll work hard with you, mm. okay? And um, bring your assignments and let's plan for you to do them well. And um, uh, which would you prefer? Gave him the option. He said, oh, and, and I talked about if you want to stay in battle and fight, you can do. Mm. He chose that. So I think I met with him every week throughout the semester and um, – um, his first semester before he came to see me, he passed two subjects just and failed two subjects. After that intervention, I don't think I'll cry, he never failed another subject. He was in the first cohort who um, graduated <laughs> out of you know, that university. And there's a glorious picture even in now in the, in the hallway of the university of that inaugural graduation. He's on the front there with his little kind of um, Batman cap flung in the air and <laughs> he discovered <laughs> he could do it. He needed to work hard. He needed some scaffolding help. But um, his life was shifted to a completely different level. His family will be socially uplifted. Yeah. Like, and, and in fact, like 10 years later, he came back and did a second degree. So like <laughs> those kind of students, um, I love journeying with them. Yeah. Okay, High <laughs> distinction students, they're easy to mark. I love marking high distinction or distinction students. But I love those people on the... Um, um, on the fringes, okay. Yeah. I, I really do love them. Yeah, okay. thank you. Thank, it's just so inspiring. For those of us who we've been in your classroom, you say, you give us a warning. I'm about to have a wobbly now. Mm -mm -mm. <laughs> so this is good. Eh? Well, you know, like, um, <laughs> you have your wobblies as yeah, well. Yeah, we we get and quite it, emotional it, and passionate. It just runs deep, and yeah. you can't you can't um, <laughs> predict when it's going to happen. Yeah. I had mine at the start of our podcast, just thinking. Yeah, yeah, just, well, you were silent I'm, for a bit. I'm just so thankful, like, yeah. just the richness and the, the greatness of God and, mm -hmm. the, and the rich life we get to live in in, in uh, right, Christian absolutely. community. So it's not all been smooth sailing, you know, <laughs> no. like our time together. Yeah. But you can you can have that wobbly moment knowing yeah. his goodness. Yeah. And in the difficult times, he brought you through. Yeah. Okay. Well... Well, you and I talk a lot about discipleship and mm -hmm. I don't think you could ever be in a class or get a handout from you without a Dallas mm -hmm. Willard mm -hmm. <laughs> quote along the way. Mm -hmm. This this journey of servant teaching and servant leadership, for you, is that, is that as an outworking of your passion for discipleship and yeah, yeah, the yeah, command absolutely. of Christ to go and, like, make disciples? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So, I, like, um... um I would retrospectively say that doctorate journey was a discipleship journey, okay? Yeah. Um, uh, and that's where kind of my model, hosting, listening, reflecting, mm. building comes from. Um, like what I, would, what I would say, and we can, we'll tease out discipleship, and I've got a Dallas quote if you want <laughs> um, as well. Like I think one of the difficulties is um, um, discipleship is resurfacing. Mm. It's coming back on the church radar, praise God. I, I reckon we need to say sorry for it not being on the radar for so long. A little bit of repentance perhaps needed. So it's coming back, which is great, okay? But if, to understand the context within which, like, um, discipleship in the 21st century, in, the, in like the third decade or whatever it is of mm. the third century, we need to understand the broader context, which, it, which, which takes me back, like, to the doctorate journey with my um, sense of, like, the age in which we... Uh, you know, living our, out our life because it feels like very much like Babylon mm. and, and it feels very much like Egypt, okay? So we're trying to kind of um, infuse discipleship um, and like, I want to host people, but I live in a world where um, people never really feel hosted. They feel tenanted because it's all about money, okay? Yeah. So like, um, and, and life seems short and hectic and pressurized. So like, um, no one's hosted. Everyone feels tenanted 
Like, if, what does that mean? It means like um, the casualization of the labor market. Everyone's on fixed term, short term, casualized contracts because employers no longer are willing to commit lifelong to their employer. So it's all short term. So everyone's tenanted. Mm. And therefore, agency is gone. No one's being heard. Everyone's being instructed. Mm. So we're tenanted, we're instructed rather than hosted and heard. And everyone, rather than being able to reflect, everyone's just rushed. So, uh, you know, what, what's happening in society is we, no one's being scaffolded or built or assembled. Sorry, scaffolded or built holistically. We just assembled and we just we go from one employer to another employer and no one cares for us. Mm. So even in the church context, how do we uh, infuse church with a culture of discipleship in a context where everybody is rushed, everyone is frenetic, mm. everyone is anxious, no one feels hosted, no one feels loved, everyone feels like short-term tenanted, contracted, and everyone just feels assembled. Mm. And um, oh, we do not want to walk into church on a Sunday and feel any of that, okay? Um, so how do we marry discipleship with that context like not everything i say will be true that's my kind of reading but certainly it's great that discipleship is surfacing and bubbling up praise god but there's a context in which it needs to fit which is complicated yeah and and ours is like a western but an australian context yeah it's a it's a wonderful to be part of partnering with god holy spirit to be part of people's formation journey isn't it Oh, absolutely. So I think you use the word built or instruction. Mm-mm-mm. I think you and I have used the term like formation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Before, because okay. it's not like there's hammer and nails and there's no, building no, no. like on a transactional yeah. basis, yeah. but it's quite organic, isn't it? And yeah, yeah, yeah. God's just doing a, a deep organic yeah, yeah. work in all of our lives. So like it's 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 a journey of spiritual formation. Yeah. Okay. And um, so it's kind of spiritual, kind of hidden, unseen, but everyone gets some form of spiritual formation. Uh, we want a Christian, Jesus, Holy Spirit infused spiritual formation. Yeah, how do we do that? Okay, it's funny. I was just reading uh, that great book by Bobby Clinton, "The Making of a Leader," mm-hmm. and, and I've sort of discerned through his writings. He believes like oh, there's yeah. there's three formations. So you've got our spiritual formation, discipleship, and then there's our ministerial formation. There's a different sort of um, often parallel yep, or yep, interacting yep. formation about yeah. you know, ministry and leadership and then there's our strategic formation yeah. which is sometimes there's big moments like for you I would say your doctorate was a, a key part of your st- strategic formation mm-hmm. yeah, because yeah, yeah. it just it leverages you for another 20, 30 years. Correct. So we've got yeah, to work yeah. out we're going to call you Pastor Nick, mm. Dr. Nick, yeah. Dr. N or whatever. I don't know. Yeah. Just Nick. Okay. <laughs> All right. But um, can we just stop there for a sec? We we'll just let that noise go because <laughs> we can come. We'll just come back. Hey, this is going great. So we're just gonna is it probably what another ten minutes, mate. So we're getting close. What is yeah, it? Yeah, we're at forty six minutes. Yeah, okay. So we we'll just do another ten. I thought I just didn't want you to be wrestling because I could see, I could just watch he gets fidgety when there's noise outside. You reckon there's um, a vacuum cleaner or a blower? It's a leaf blower, it's a leaf blower outside. Yeah, This is great. Yep. I won't worry about education, young ministers. What are your key, what are your keys? Um, what do they need to know? You know, mate. This is this is taking on such a beautiful flavour. I'm trying. I watch when he gets fidgety. I I got to start getting fidgety. Son. I just leaf blower. I might have had this conversation with you. Like an unnecessary innovation. Like, I, I love it. You know, like my, my mum gets out there and does it, and, no, and it empowers not. her. Walking to school, you know, like um, in autumn, just yeah. kicking the leaves. Yeah. Like all those years, no one ever was complaining. Like, we need a machine to blow them away. Well, what are you going to do? You're going to blow them from there to there. Okay? For me, it is just an, like someone's making a whole load of money out of a... And all that happens is people are trying to have a business meeting and the, the, the little um, leaf blower is going. And they think they're doing a I found service out, I to... I found out Nick's pet hate. Leaf blowers. Why community. do we need to create them? <laughs> okay. What I might do is I go to number 10. Why, why have you given your life to work for God, right? I might just stick there. 
and we'll go to number 13, just about um, part of the flourishing life in this question is just dismantle on the other spectrum, toxic positivity, which we're always, everything's always up all the time. You guys never, we never have any problems. Oh, yeah, the okay. flourishing life is yeah. about a perfect life. Like as yeah, Ben yeah. Dutaker said, the Truman, we live on the Truman Show set. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Still yeah. sterile. Oh, yeah. Well, that's a bit of a yeah. Pentecostal thing, yes. isn't it? Yeah, that's right. So okay. pardon me. Let's do it. Okay. <laughs> we keep going, mate? Yes. This is great. This is absolutely amazing. Mm. Okay, okay. This is absolutely amazing, Nick. Can I ask this? Yeah. What? Well, why have you given your life you know, to follow God and to to work for God and even to pivot away from a really well paid academic job and now Mm-mm-mm. working for the kingdom on a, a, a different on a different basis? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great question. Because um, like. The easy answer is, um, I, I would say, maybe I answered his call, okay? But I'd go, like, maybe I answered the call um, slowly and accumulatively. Um, mm. But um, just to go back to my travelling, okay? So two countries that really kind of helped on th- this question and answering it. One would be... Guatemala, one would be Poland. And when I'm in Guatemala and when I'm in Poland, like, I am not with f- family, okay? Like, I'm just parachuted mm. in solo. So I lived with, you know, Guatemalan family, lived with a Polish family, but mum and dad, my mum and dad, my sisters, like Kim, they're not there. So, like, I'm just parachuted in. They're both Catholic countries, mm. okay? They're both inherently Roman Catholic. And um, <clears throat> um, I just loved being free to go into a Catholic cathedral, a Catholic church, Um, like whenever during the week or whenever I bumped into one, I'd just sit in the pew and I'd look at the stained glass windows and so forth and I'd have uh, moments of solitude and like while I cannot remember the conversations that I might have Mm. with my Heavenly Father there was something deep and rich going on and there was a curiosity in me and there was a thirst and a hunger in me because I had probably gone there to try and find happiness, okay? Um, And I discovered that joy was, for me, a life lived in conversation with God, okay? So... Those lessons, the Guatemalan, the Polish, Roman Catholic lessons, um, enabled me to want to uh, pursue a lifelong journey conversing with God, and I would then say enabling him to open up the doors or close the doors. So I kind of held it lightly. Dallas Willard talks Mm. about leave the outcomes to God. So I just sense I have walked and conversed with God through his Holy Spirit following Jesus into a life that in like 2024, um, I can say, has been inherently flourishing, though challenging in certain seasons. So it's not like, super glossy varnish, varnish, you know, everything was milk and honey. It, it was not always milk and honey, but I think like Paul, I have learned to find his peace and his joy yeah. through all of it, okay? Had I not had Jesus, I reckon I would have been taken out yeah. and I would not be anywhere close to be leading a flourishing life. Yeah. So what does a tough season look like for you? You said like you dig deep, you know, get look for joy. Yeah, yeah. But but what 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 do you you do? Because life hasn't always been peaches yeah, yeah. and cream for you and Kim and the family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like um just to, what what have we navigated? We've navigated a miscarriage. Um like dad's on a cancer journey now. Um like way 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 back. Uh, this is like I love the church, okay? Um, sold out for the church. But when I first met Kim, I courted. That's old language, mm-hmm. okay? Mm-hmm. Don't know what the new vernacular is. Like, we just went out for, like, two years, and we attended a Chinese ev- evangelical church in London. 
and um, I was the outsider because I'm not Chinese, but I went there and 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 at the end of that journey, like I was called into the elders' office. This is the church elders of the Chinese evangelical church that me and Kim attended. It was more her church and mine, yeah. but I went in love, so I went along. They they called me out because they doubted my faith. Okay, so like I sat in front of you know the, the Holy Trinity, the three of them, and. Um, Elder Peter asked me, Nick, we're just worried. Is Jesus Christ the center of your life? And I can remember thinking, like, I reckon he is, yes. And I certainly want him to be. Is he the center of yours, Peter? That's in my head. I didn't ask. <laughs> so the result of that was like um, Kim was told not to see me ever again, okay? Just to cut off all stuff with me. Oh. And um, so, like, painfully, like, that happened. That's why I went to Poland. Like, I couldn't be in the same city or the same country if this woman I love mm. um, is not allowed through church leadership to have anything to do with me. Like A bit like, um, you know, Jonah. <laughs> I yeah. just went to Poland and camped out there for a year. And, and like, God, what can you do? Like, Because yeah. it seems as though um, it has been ordained by church leaders yeah. that me and Kim ain't going to be together yeah. again. So, like, there is one of the most deep, painful seasons, okay? Wow. Now, you ask, y y your question was to kind of ask how I navigate that. Well, you know, like, uh, yeah, and I've not answered yeah. yet. You still want yeah. me to answer? Yeah. Well, you know, like, I limp through it, okay? Yeah. It's painful. I don't deny that. Um, and, um, you know, at the end of the doctorate, it was tough, harsh. You know, I felt anxious, pressured didn't think it could come through, all that kind of la-di-da. So there's a more recent. Yeah. So, like, I've learned um, um, expect a verse to surface or yeah. expect verses to surface. Um, find a song for the season. So um, my most played mm. Spotify song last year, 66 times, was I Will Wait On You, you know, Elevation Church, Maverick yes. City. Because... How come? I, I played it 66 times because when I parked the car at the USQ and went in, knowing I wanted to be at this new ministry job, I, as I walked across the field down the, yep. the entrance of the unit, I had yep. that playing. So I kind of, um, I, I walked through my valley with a song for the season. Yeah. Okay? In previous seasons, uh, blessed be the... Blessed be the name yep. you give and you take away yeah. that. Like, yeah. will, I, will I only love you when you give me the flourishing life or can I love you when you take stuff away from me or stuff is taken away from me? So when <laughs> Kim, before we married, is taken away from me, can I learn to love God? Can I trust he will cause it all to, to work together for, for good? I yeah. just learned to trust, but I... A song for the season, verse, verses, yeah, bold verse, yeah. and like, um, like I, I don't eat much. Like fasting is super easy because my appetite's quenched. Got some people who will, um, their faith will carry me through. Yeah, and um, like I have got permission in my, you know, black cloud, grumpiness, whatever it is, to continue to converse with God. So. God has been gracious to allow me to converse with him when I can't see what on earth is going on and it seems as though I am not getting what I wanted. Yeah. I've been in the ring long enough now to have some evidence that like gets through this thick skull that um, <laughs> he has got my best interest at heart. That's powerful. Okay? What a great story. Yeah. Digging deep, you've got some keys. <laughs> Pardon me, because I want to I want to honour the moment, mm. yeah. You because know, it's yeah, you know, just it's just awesome, mate. As you can just see this resonating. It's part of me that's still stuck back in the Chinese church in London, because it's Sunday morning. Because I know Saturday night you'd go to the Indian restaurant, the bagels, and newspapers. You weren't sitting in church mm. with curry stains, eating no, no, bagels, no. reading the paper in church, were you? No, but you see, like, um, <laughs> here's the thing, and and because like, Elder Peter. He said grace at our wedding, okay? Oh. He said grace. Uh, Full cycle we, of redemption. I hadn't really sorted out on the day who's going to say grace. So we're all there. It's like there's lots of people. It's kind of potluck wedding. Just tapped him on the shoulder. Elder Peter, can you can you say grace and bless us? Yeah. And it, like, it's like a uh, <laughs> spiritual hidden 
<laughs> uppercut. <laughs> uppercut. Okay. How dare you? Yeah. Have, how dare you have doubted the love yeah, yeah, yeah. that Jesus put in my heart for Nyo Kim Lee? And here we are, whatever it is, married 30 years this year, three kids. Yeah, congratulations, okay. mate. Great. Those elders were not going to rob God's big gift for me yeah. and, and my flourishing life and Kim's flourishing life. That's good. That's good. There's a leadership lesson in there, okay? You're always the proper English gentleman as well, all right? <laughs> Darn that man. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But I've let it go. Yeah. Well, Nick, um, thanks for your time. Yeah, it's been Thank inspiring you. to sort of capture an element of your journey, how mm. uniquely shaped you've been, how diligent you've been mm. before our guy. Um, as students respect you, like mm. you've got yourself a, a great new role in a new mm -hmm. season. Like you really are a pin-up guy for the flourishing life in thick and thin. So thank yeah. you for our friendship. No, thank you. And we're looking forward to another great semester mm -mm. at the college. Yes. God's doing great things. I can't believe yeah. that we get to do what we do together. Yeah, and it's beautiful, okay? So yeah. thank you so much. To be continued. To be continued. <laughs> God bless you, Nick. Thank All you. Right. Bless you. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, if you've enjoyed this episode, can you do me just one thing? One favour, please. Can I encourage you to share with this with a friend, a colleague, or someone who would be blessed or inspired or challenged by some of the content. I love the guests that we have and they bring such a richness of them uh, for the benefit of Kingdom Purpose. So please share it with one friend. God bless you.